yeah, let me give a, a, an introduction to our keynote speakers, uh, and that's Joe Justice, we have here. Uh, Joe is a Seattle area agile business process consultant and un entrepreneur. Is that okay to call an entrepreneur? Okay, <laughs> uh, and a registered automotive manufacturer since 2006. He's a nominated, nominated TED speaker and currently a business process consultant at Solutions IQ and a CEO of Wikispeak. And we've also got uh, Tim Meyer. Uh, Tim had joined Wikispeed in, uh, last December, last December, uh, in order to revolutionise the automotive industry one modular car at a time. And also we've got Stefan, Stefan Sunshen. Is that? Yeah, brilliant. Stefan, Stefan uh, from Take Communications, uh, business uh, analyst, uh, lead at Take Communications. Uh, and he's going to be getting involved with the uh, presentation tonight as well, also from Wikispeed. Fantastic. So once again, thank you very much for taking communications for letting us, let us have our speakers tonight. Uh, now, you're going to talk for around about 40 minutes? Depends what people want, yeah. but uh, yeah. I think that's about the amount of content we got for us today. Great, so 40 minutes uh, and then questions at the end. Um, so about an hour's work. But without further ado, let me introduce our keynote speakers uh, for tonight. Thank you. Folks, thank, thanks for coming out. Um, coming into Wellington, it looks like a beautiful place to spend time. And you can be anywhere on that beautiful waterfront having a drink. Thanks for coming in and being agile nerds with us. Appreciate it. I'm Joe Justice, I'm a Seattle, Washington, United States area business process consultant, but I'm not here to talk about that at all. I'm here to talk about what I do at night and on weekends, which is work with Team Wikispeed. We built a safe, affordable, ultra-efficient car, and the first running prototype of it to achieve over 100 miles per gallon. Um, I think that would be 1.5 liters per 100 kilometers here your cycle, I think. We built that first running prototype in three months. How's that even possible when the cars around us seem to change so slowly? Here you see a mainstream hybrid sedan, and over a six-year time span, it gains an additional two miles per gallon. And they added vents to the bumper, and then took them away. <laughs> Manufacturing tends to change so slowly because the cost to make change is so high. Here we see a door mold being stamped at uh, Tesla's new Model S factory, a very modern facility, and that door mold is about $10 million when you include its development time. If an engineer found a safer, less expensive, more ergonomic, more user-friendly door mold pattern tomorrow, the company wouldn't want to adopt it. Not for another 10 years. They want to amateurize the cost of the first door mold first, and this delays innovation in traditional manufacturing. This is not uncommon in manufacturing teams, and in fact, software teams used to work the exact same way. It's the waterfall, what we're familiar with, the bane of our agile existence. Porsche just announced the current generation 911 is going to be with us the next 14 years. Parts of that car were developed in a three-year cycle. All of that car together was developed in about a 10-year time span. Well, there are some parts that are much, much older than that, but most of it in about 10 years. What that means is you will be able to go to a Porsche dealer and buy a brand new Porsche 911, and it'll be what the engineers thought you might want 25 years ago. New software teams do exactly the same cycle, but much, much, much faster. They do it every seven days. I think we're the first automotive company to have new models every seven days. And here's how that works. In order for that to be even possible, for the cost to make change to be low enough to do that, our car's modular. It splits into eight pieces. The engine can roll out the back, and we can change it from gasoline to electric in about the time it takes to change a tire. The aero shell on top it lifts off its carbon fiber, and we can switch it for another one. So you can switch from a pickup truck to a convertible to a family car in about the time it takes to change a tire. This reduces our cost to make change. We iterate the car in hours. We swarm 
using XP, and we pair using XP, although it's not programming, so we call it XM, Extreme Manufacturing. <laughs> and here we are taking the eight modules of the car apart and then putting them back together. This is what our first running prototype looked like. This is what a vertical slice of a car looked like to us. We entered in the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize. It was a $10 million challenge to see if it were even possible to build cars that achieved over 100 miles per gallon, or about double what a Toyota Prius gets now, with four seats and road legal safety specifications. That contest was in 2010, and we didn't win. We didn't get the $10 million. We tied for 10th out of 136 entrants from all over the world. We came in ahead of some names you might recognize, like Tesla Motors, like MIT, like Tata Motors from India. And while those teams were figuring out where they were going to build their car, how much it was going to cost, what materials it was going to be made out of, and what its design plan was, we just built one and put it on the road, and we're already collecting road legal data. This is quite familiar to those of you on Agile Teams now. For those of you here to learn about Agile Teams, you'll be hearing a lot of this kind of thing, where what would typically be the design phase, you just already have working product. Now you can see our car's not pretty. It is what I would say aesthetically challenged. <laughs> Two years later, now, we're making these cars in Germantown, Maryland. They have the same ultra-efficient mechanicals underneath, and since that body swaps on and off, this is the iteration we're on now. What I think this shows is that you can have a running proof of concept very quickly, and then you can actually even make it pretty in record time. In less time than it takes a traditional automotive manufacturing company to set up a plant to manufacture a transmission that they already designed, we have a whole new product line and a whole new business with a revolutionary product with about twice the fuel efficiency of its nearest gasoline competitor. This is what a modular tractor starts out looking like. This is made by a group in Missouri called Open Source Ecology. Their goal is to make a set of 50 machines that they think are the minimum set of machinery required to rebuild civilization, to have the current level of comfort that people live and use now. Things like tractors, bread ovens, circuit makers, linear solar collectors. Their idea is, by putting all of those in open source, people are no longer being pulled into the existing company hierarchy, and they can choose to remake their own if they want to. It also reduces cost of maintenance, because when the product is open source, there's kind of competition for replacement parts, and the owners can modify those pieces of equipment or maintain them themselves should they choose to. One of their products is a car. One of their 50 machines in their global village construction set, they call it, is a car. So we took one of the versions of the Wikispeed car and published it for free online under an open source license. That was a little bit scary from a business model perspective for us. What we got was a whole lot more global awareness, a whole lot more investment, a bunch more team members joining the team, and some more customers. Here's Maker Plane. They follow the Wikispeak model, so they say. Uh, and by that I mean, I just am glad they credited us. They said they got the idea from us, and I'm thrilled about that. Uh, they use Agile for hardware project. In this case, it's a four to six seat light aircraft that they're building, and it's in design now. The tool we use, tools we used to do this did not exist 10 years ago. Most of them didn't exist even five years ago. It would be difficult or even impossible to run a hardware team this way, or a distributed software team even, with... Hello. <laughs> to run a, a project of this type even just five years ago. This is brand new stuff. Agile itself was a term coined in 2001. And the tools to support it at this level, with uh, our, our team is 150 team members in 15 countries working simultaneously on the same sprints. The tools that make it happen are all free and all new. Here's an iteration on our aesthetics. We start with a cat, and typically, someone we've never met somewhere in the world draws a cat at the exterior of the car. They usually have loaded up a cat of our chassis, our engine module, our suspension, our interior module, and they've drawn something that sits on the top. Usually after they've done that, they feel like they have an understanding, they can start designing other modules and other components. In team, we vote if we want to build that car, 
And when we pick one, we CNC machine it life size in foam in one day. Then we lay it up in composites, in structural carbon fiber in this case, in one day. And these are our seven day iterations. Then we go to the largest auto show in the world. And they put us on the main floor between Ford and Chevrolet and around the corner from GM. And I was terrified. <laughs> I did not know how it was going to go. This is the first iteration of this type that we did. And lucky for us, the car was beautiful. We had press in every UN language, and the team grew dramatically as a result. It, it was uh, luckily a success. Then we're filmed by the Discovery Channel. And then we launched a crowdfunding campaign to uh, enable the mass manufacturing of the future of automotive transportation. Now we don't have audio out on the laptop. I'm going to hold the mic to it. We'll see if this works. This car is 100 miles per gallon. This car is completely modular. Analytics and budgeting staff are terrified. 
They say, you mean that annual budgeting cycle we do? We've got to do that every week? No, of course not. Budgeting does happen every week, but we don't have that large annual budgeting cycle anymore. We have a list of KPIs that are maintained once a week to make funding decisions once a week. Once that happens, they tend to feel like they're steering the company much more tightly, much more accurately. Because instead of picking a date a year out and saying, let's run to that date, and then we see how accurate that was or not. 60% of all projects go over budget or fail, right, is the statistic the Standards Report gives us. Or they say, let's pick what we're going to do just in the next week and rush towards that. And they feel a heightened sense of control over the company, and not just sense, they actually have more um, actual ability to influence the course and the future of their products. How does a company even try this? Uh, extreme manufacturing, agile for hardware companies, for engineering, for physical goods. They start with a pilot team is what we're recommending. They budget a team run rate not tied to a project or product. So this team is funded, and we'll see what this team can produce over this certain amount of time. Then they create a backlog of difficult and high profile values. That takes the executive management team, usually is the people doing this, about one day. And the idea is, what would you do if you could? What really risky or really impactful thing would you take on but you just don't think you can do now? And those are the types of backlog items that we fish for. Then pick the team. Uh, ideally, they're all in the same room, they're all co-located. Ideally, they're collaborative, they're working in pairs and swarms using XP and XM practices. Ideally, they're dedicated, this is the only backlog they're working against. And ideally, they're cross-functional, they're solving each other's tasks and taking ownership from, of the product together. Now, we can work with distributed teams, Team Wiki Speed absolutely does, 17 countries. And we can work with non-dedicated teams. Team WikiSpeed team members are all volunteers after work on nights and weekends, so we're, not, we're definitely not their only backlog item. But we see the highest velocities when all these things are true, so that's always what we ask for. Then the group around that team is trained, because that new team is going to be working in a really different way than most of the organization around them. So we start by training the group around them. It takes about a day, and we say, maybe you give piece of hardware to this team once a year. Maybe once a quarter you do an audit on this team. Maybe once every week you give uh, some software updates or an API update to this team. But we're instead going to be doing a very small part of that work every day for this team, and this team is going to be giving you a very small part of their work every day. Without that training, there tends to be resistance from the group around this new team that's working on this faster moving way. That this makes it more sustainable to start with that surrounding group. Then the team itself is trained in three days. So this is typically an off-site immersion, scrum training, agile training, XP practices for quality, that type of thing. Then that team is coached two to four days per month until the team has an emergent internal coach that takes on that responsibility and becomes savvy at that level. And we now have this one high-performing team. To scale that out, it's repeated across the group that team's in. It grows across groups after every team in that group is now Agile, Lean, and Scrum. It grows across groups, and the mechanism is pairing across teams, rotating pairs through teams. We don't want to dissolve a high-performing team and split them up to go see new teams. We've just destroyed this culture that's emerged. So instead, we rotate pairs through teams to uh, pair the best practices and see the culture. Now let's get a little bit more technical about this happens. I'd like to introduce Tim Meyer. My name is Tim Meyer, and I'm a member of Team Wik WikiSpeed. I've been with Team WikiSpeed since the middle of December of last year. Uh, and I'm also an extreme programming co coach with Solutions IQ. So I have the pleasure of being able to work with Joe during my day job and nights and weekends. <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen how to introduce the extreme manufacturing process into a company. But what are its values? What are its core values? In the 1980s, as Toyota Motor Corporation was becoming the number one automotive company in the USA, uh, the president of Toyota Motor Corporation US was asked, you're obviously doing something right. Why isn't anyone writing a book about this? He said, because that book would only be one page. 
keep it simple, make it visible, and trust people who are doing the work for you. At Wikispeed, we try to embrace those core values as well. So simplicity. We've already seen V1 of the Wikispeed car. Pretty simple. How do we keep it simple? We pair. When you're pairing, one person is concentrating on the what, and one person is concentrating on the how. When you're too deep in the how, when you're heads down cutting aluminum or tracking down bugs in the engine wiring harness or wiring together an accelerator pedal, you might lose sight of what you're doing and who you're doing it for. We do TDD test-driven design for hardware. Now our tests, they don't always look like a red bar and a green bar. Instead, they might look like a bank of red lights that turn to green as acceptance criteria are fulfilled. If you look at the National Transportation Safety Board and the criteria you have to meet in the automotive industry in the US, those are some pretty strict criteria. But they're pretty clear. And in V1 of the Wikispeed car, what happened was we just had a big bank of lights. And as we satisfied the criteria, doing the simplest thing that worked, each of those red lights turned green. And we had our automated test suite. Visibility, how do we keep it visible? Well, you'll see our Kanban board in the background there. That's at a local shop. We use big information radiators at our local shops, and we have Kanban boards so everyone can see the back off of that local shop and view as, as tasks go from in progress to done to accepted. We pair. Another way to keep visibility within a team. We're spreading knowledge. We're seeding culture. We use tools for distributing. At this point, Wikispeed has over 150 members in 17 countries. So our tools for distributed teams might include something like Scrummy. Our global backlog is kept online. Our local backlogs are kept in shop. So the things that people are working on at that local branch of Wikispeed are kept in shop. And trusting people to do the right thing. It's one of our teams swarming around our chassis for V1. You're going to see a theme, pairing. We generate trust because we pair. We promiscuously pair. We, <laughs> we use a pull model versus a push model. So we trust our team members to pull work when they're available. Now, as I said, during the day, Joe is a uh, is a mild-mannered business process consultant uh, before he puts on his cape at night and does uh, 40 hours per week of, of work for Wikispeed. I tend to do more four to eight hours per week of work for Wikispeed, so I'm not a superhero. Uh, but we work for Solutions IQ during the day, and we do technical coaching and business process consulting. And one of the clients we've had the pleasure of working with is John Deere. Now, I just, I love this. So, John Deere, who's familiar with John Deere? Everyone, right? You know that they produce high quality goods. They've been around forever, for 175 years, making tractors and farm equipment. They know how to estimate how long it's going to take to make a tractor, right? I mean, 175 years of experience, they better know. So the 80-30 tractor development process, it's quite predictable, OK? We expect to hit the capital plan perfectly and R&D spending within 5%. 5%? That's pretty ambitious. We know how many resources we need and when we need them. That's from the, the large tractor engineering director at John Deere, Mr. Winkus. That was 2007. Uh-oh. This is from a Spanish report a couple of years later. Like 60% of all projects, the 
the 8030 project was extended six months from prediction. And the team of engineers that had worked so hard, six, seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day, 175 years of experience, that's a fairly large overage. So that speaks to the myth of predictability and what we're aiming for with Wikispeed in using these added techniques, in inspecting and adapting, and figuring out what we need to do next in quick cycles. Next, I'm going to bring up Stefan. He's a Wikispeed team member, and he also works at Tate Communications in Christchurch. So, um, before I get to the slide, let me share a story with you uh, on how I met Joe and Tim and what it means to work with him. Um, it all started in January of this year when we at Tate ran a workshop with Henrik. This workshop, we tried to get together a truly cross functional team, but it was not that easy to get buy in from all these different disciplines we were working with. I was lucky at the end to get one hardware engineer to be part of this workshop. So, at the end of the workshop, I asked him, So, did you get anything out of this? And he said, No, not really. So, I knew. Today, um, we are halfway through the workshop, and um, yesterday, the same hardware engineer approached us and asked, could we get an hour with Joe and Tim, maybe, if you want to talk about a few things? This hour today, the meeting happened today, well, he came with 17 of his colleagues, <laughs> and the hour wasn't enough, and there will be a follow-up meeting tomorrow. And that is an example that shows that working with Wikispeed, Joe and Tim, is a real state change. And on the map here we have the countries that were I mentioned. You see most of them are in Europe, but we also have South Africa, India, and other parts of Asia. <coughs> and then we have this era in New Zealand highlight. Another state change I would suggest is, well, wouldn't it be great to have a Wikispeed shop here in New Zealand to innovate, build a real prototype and maybe more. And um, I talked to some other people who opened a shop and it all seems to start with um, hearing about Joe and everything else follows from that. Um, we have here Alex in Virginia City. But there are other examples where, yeah, that is the idea at the beginning and then people get passionate about what can be done. And this is the scrumming uh, backlog. And for the NZ team, we have got two stories. First this here, find a barn in the country. <laughs> Some of you might know an agile nerd who has one. Um, and the, the second is, um, get practical. It costs 488 US to get the chassis here and maybe we could start from there. And what would it mean to work for half of the day uh, and Wikis speed look like? It's not just about cars. You could engineer and prototype and model and uh, test drive. But you could also get involved um, with um, agile uh, program management or run a marketing campaign, or write a song. And let's assume
assume all this is in place, then we could contribute to um, what is currently on uh, YouTube slash Wikispeed. There are 48 hours of um, talk and demonstration of what's happening at Wikispeed. Here's one example.
what I would ask you to do is spend between two and four hours a week doing a social good project. And I would encourage you to use agile methodologies for it because it seems like we get things done a whole lot faster and with a whole lot less resources when we use it. If there's a better methodology tomorrow, we will use it. And I hope you guys do too. But right now, Agile, Lean, Scrum, XP, XM are the leanest, fastest things we know, the most in stewardship of resource methodologies we know to rapidly solve problems for social good. And whether it's with Team Wiki Speed or on your own, if everyone in this room spent between two and four hours a week rapidly solving problems for social good, it would be so awesome. It would be like a gorilla high-fiving a shark in front of an explosion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Progressive Insurance Automotive Express. 
The X Prize was a one, the Automotive X Prize was a one-time event in 2010. Us tying for 10th place in the mainstream class, well, that was it. We were out. Um, what it did mean is we received several tens of thousands of dollars in automotive consulting from this company called Roush Industries in Dearborn, Michigan. They do some of the road legal safety testing and certifications for Ford, GM, and Mercedes-Benz. They do some for Toyota, some for Honda, some for Isuzu, but the majority of it's Ford and, uh, and Mercedes-Benz. So we brought our car there for emissions testing and then crash testing, and we published those in the team. And I'm trying to publish them online, but I need to get it subtitled first. So if somebody here knows their way around a subtitling task, if you went to scrummy.com slash wikispeed, there's a task called Subtitle Crash Testing and Fuel Economy Test Videos. If somebody can do that, we can get those on YouTube also. So please do. Then, that's related to test data. We publish all of our test data, uh, but not every part of our car is open source. We do have some IP. Um, I guess it depends where the conversation goes. We can talk about what, how we choose what's what, if that's part of what's interesting here, why we protect some and publish some. But uh, the short story is the majority of our advances, we look at it, if GM, Chevrolet, or Honda could reverse engineer our advances in less than one month's time, it's probably not worth us protecting. And part of what augments that is, with manufacturing growing and growing and growing in the brick countries, that many of which don't respect patents anyway, most products are becoming open source by default. <laughs> <laughs> Whether the company thinks so or not. So if our competitors could figure it out in less than a month, and if another manufacturing company could start making the same thing if they chose to, the only people that are missing out are the passionate enthusiasts who don't have the time to reverse engineer our product and who would help us if they knew. That said, we still don't have everything in the public domain, but most of it is. And also, once we push it into the public domain, we're now, we now have prior art, and it can't be patented for anyone else to prevent us from doing it. Um, so did that talk close to what the question was, or did I talk around it? No, that was very good. I was particularly interested in uh, um, you know, the, the concept Sports car that gets 100 miles per gallon seems pretty, you know, it's compelling, isn't it? Outside the normal <laughs> expectations. So. The car is meant to be the future commuter car for everybody, the ultimate family car. It turns out the shape that has the aerodynamic drag we care about happens to look pretty racy. Yeah. The car is fast, and I enjoy it a lot. It's mid engine, rear wheel drive, and it's a uh, boot. It's 0 to 60 is in right about 5 seconds. It's plenty quick. But that's because it's very light and very aerodynamic. It's also, of course, extremely efficient, and that's the real point. It does look pretty aggressive, too, though, but that's for aerodynamic reasons, and I'll, and I'll insist on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that was the next question. Um, and is this for Stephen and Tim or any of us? Not very good. 
there's plenty of very important pieces remaining to iterate to get them to highly useful levels from raw prototype. I bet there's several people in this room that know several people that could do great things with that in two to four hours a week. And I bet some of them might be able to make meaningful contributions to our efficiency and our environmental footprint as well. So the sooner we have a garage space, we can put a car in it and see what happens when it's iterated here. So materials, machinery, manpower, but maybe we can also say a parking space. <laughs> Eventually, it'd be great to have a commercial facility, but really to start, somebody's shed. They could roll out their lawnmower and put it under a tarp for the rest of the rest of the winter and say, yeah, it's all right, every Thursday night, 10 strangers can come in and work on this project of yours, you agile people, that's fine. And we can see where that takes us. Um, so that's what we need. And we need all of you to make it happen. But uh, in terms of uh, money, oh, not so much, we're okay. Our primary funding is people send us $10 a month through PayPal. And we build everything with that. Folks all over the world say, yeah, that's cool, that should happen, the world should have it. And then we've sold, it's really we've sold two prototypes, but I haven't met the other one. So to me it feels like we only sold one. The other guy who sent money, I have no idea who they are, what they look like. 25,000. Um, so, th so that pushes all the development on. I mean, we're doing fine. We wouldn't go out of business in another three years at the current pace. If people wanted to, it would be totally awesome if you micro-invested in us. And that $10 a month is uh, on our website. There's a button that says support team wiki speed every month. And what that means is if we profit, We'll see if it work. this works. We're finding out right now. You would too. It's not a approved stock distribution, nothing like that. It's much more lean. It just simply says if we issue, if we recognize profit, we'll distribute it equitably, equitably across all the people who believed in us. So that'd be neat, but we're doing okay. It's no desperate dire straits. Uh, other questions? Yes? Sorry, I think you, you were getting to it, and I just want to ask you about. About market feedback. I know you're still early phase, but can you tell us about that side of things? Uh, about market feedback? Yeah, so actually testing your, you know, you've got R&D going on there, mm -hmm. testing and marketing. Every weekly demo, we have customers. Yeah. And every weekly demo, we have them interact with it, and we have them prioritize the backlog. Um, so, yeah. It's looking viable. Sure. We drive them around already. Uh, there's the iPhone in the dash for the navigation and the stereo. But that's about the only convenience feature that I mentioned. There are not yet a couple of words. <laughs> but there's some parts that are just like, yeah, we drive them around the road, we have a good time. And they're, did I mention they're fast? <laughs> uh, did that talk to it a little bit, or did I not get there yet? No, 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 is the test driven development. We don't say, build a catalytic converter. We say, pass this emissions test. And we get frugal engineering and frugal innovation and really out of the box thinking because people, they might not even know what a catalytic converter is. They're, tar they're taking a completely different perspective on solving the problem by racing to pass the test. That's different than market feedback, but what you said made me start to think about the inspected app rapid cycle, inspected app uh, transparent that has advocated by Eric Ries and Lean Startup. And um, that lets us have a product in front of potential customers and investors very quickly, which we did. And so we, all our demos are public for that reason. Did that talk a little closer? Yeah, that's good. OK, <laughs> awesome. Um, I thought I saw a hand over this way. Uh, in the back. So in the start of the slides, you showed, you talked about training the team. And you were suggesting that with a couple of days training, you can teach other groups around that team how they can now engage with them. Right. But I don't quite understand, without those other teams having their training as well, how could you suddenly expect them to go from their yearly delivery of financial records or a tool that you're saying to suddenly being able to be agile with this new team? So if I understood the question, it was about the uh, a slide a little bit back on how would a company adopt extreme manufacturing. And it said, with uh, one day of training, a group now knows how to support a new XM team or an agile team for hardware. I mean, it's the same stuff you guys know. Um, isn't that cool? It's actually the same stuff. And now suddenly there's all these other domains it seems to apply to. That's kind of awesome. Um, 
So if I followed it was, how can that group around support it with one day of training, especially when we're talking about moving from an annual budgeting cycle to a weekly budgeting cycle, uh, KPI driven instead of annual budgeting driven? Was that the question? That was the Okay. Um, that one day training prepares the environment for the new Agile team to not be squashed and forced to behave the way they used to behave and does not yet do anything to HR, finance, or the C-suite. What does things to upper management is radical management. Some of you may know all about that. Steve Denning, um, Peter Stevens, super savvy people, and how to make Agile adoption sustainable by migrating from uh, maximize shareholder profit to maximize customer delight. And when and there's a set of practices to make that responsible and say it in terms of business 101 and say, okay, I won't lose my business even if I'm shifting my focus. And that allows for compatibility with agile teams. So that happens as a separate thing. And the reason why it's separate is because until there's a portfolio of agile teams, they wouldn't be compatible with the business then either. Now, if you're starting a new company, you can start all that at once. When you're changing a company, when you're doing an enterprise agile adoption for an existing company in life, especially with any level of cultural inertia, um, once you have a whole group of agile teams, so the slide talked about scaling out agile teams by pairing across a group until you had an entire group of agile teams, that's when we start talking to finance and to HR about saying, okay, how you're going to bonus people now does have to change because they're now working in a different way. If you bonus them on their previous method, they're going to revert to their previous method and we won't have these velocities anymore. If your hire, fire, and promotion decisions are using the same KPIs, it will not be compatible with this group of teams you have now. You can get away with it when you have one team. You can get away with it when you have a couple teams. When you have an entire group of teams working in this method, HR and finance now have to change their method. And, uh, and the budgeting cycle now changes from annual to, uh, to weekly. And upper management now adopts something like radical management. That's then the enterprise agile adoption because we now have high performing agile teams across the group and we have a portfolio of agile teams. Did I talk to what you asked or did I miss the boat and go around it? I got the boat. I'm still starting to see how one team can be agile and sort of surrounded by non agile teams. But it sounds like you just need to keep the group. And if I heard the trailing bit, it was how can one agile team work surrounded by non agile teams? Scrum's superpower, out of all the methodologies we're talking about, is that it can thrive in a highly dysfunctional organization. <laughs> <laughs> the scrum master and the product owner can have tasks in the backlog that are generate all the legacy documents, planning documents, KPIs that the company is used to expecting. Meanwhile, they're just pulling from the backlog. It can be strongly insular if it has to, and that is super savvy of it. Um, perfect for one of the first rapidly growing tenacious agile methodologies. So Scrum can live in this hostile environment. And then as teams grow around it, there's now the group level organism, whether you're using Scrum, Scrums, or Kanban of Kanbans, or anything else, that says, okay, now we have to be recognized as first class citizens because we're not going to lie anymore and say that we're being bonused on individual performance because ultimately it's obviously team performance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the way one team can function, or a small number of teams, is Scrum's really good at that. Um, that's its uh, quiet, hidden revolution, just waiting to, uh, waiting to be obvious and tell everybody what's really going on. <laughs> Were there, was there other questions? Uh, yes? You've yeah, been very quiet about the power unit that uh, allowed you to reach 150. I'm quite interested in what, what motor you were. <laughs> 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 Bowls. Bowl, a bold call, but how did you get there? If I understand the question, it's how did you get such an efficient car? <laughs> What's the engine? For yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you. So, I'm a software background person, and when I started the team WikiSpeed, so I was member number one, and then luckily for me, by blogging my retrospectives, the what was going well, what wasn't going well, and any blocking issues, that transparency got people interested, they could actually learn something. So I was 
not hiding anything. I, I couldn't. I was a team of one. Right? What do I have to lose? Um, and, uh, and then volunteers started coming to assist. And by the time we passed all the technical deliverables for the X Prize, we had 44 team members in four countries. That was uh, when we were finalists. That was beginning of 2010. And grown since then. Um, in the very beginning, it was, is this even possible? The X Prize announced this challenge, $10 million to anybody who can, any company, any university, any individual. And so I did exploratory testing. I modeled the EPA city and highway driving cycle to try to be predictive about it. For a whole big set of inputs, how efficient would a car with those parameters be? And lucky for me, there's this huge data set. Every car sold in the United States is measured on that cycle. And I could go out and measure that car and measure its rolling resistance, or a lot of it's already posted online, and I could check it with a few different resources, and then see if when I put it through the algorithm, I got what the EPA got. And then once I had plus or minus 1%, I did exploratory testing. So the automated testing that says, well, what are the boundary conditions? Is 100 miles per gallon even possible? And it came back and said, yeah, you can. And then the human step is looking at those and seeing what you're actually feasible from the parameter set. And it turned out there were two that were very highly competitive that could possibly, according to this algorithm, get 100 miles per gallon on the city and highway driving cycle in the United States. And uh, about twice the fuel economy of a Toyota Prius. And they were about $40,000 of lithium ion batteries could meet the X-Price scoring criteria and achieve the miles per gallon or equivalent. Or about $4 worth of gas with this uh, really efficient engine. And the three main parameters for that, so this is how did we get to 100 miles per gallon, were total vehicle weight, absolutely what you'd expect. Total vehicle, uh, coefficient of drag, the aerodynamic drag, and then the engine efficiency measured in brake-specific fuel consumption. Most automotive manufacturers, most engine makers don't even talk about the brake-specific fuel consumption, which is really silly. That's the number one metric for the efficiency of an engine at a time. That's actually the sole metric when you're talking about its efficiency. Per gram of fuel that comes in, how many kilowatts of energy come out the other side? That's the one thing we care about, and they don't talk about it much which is silly because any of their competitors can find it out in about 10 minutes on a dynamometer. So we knew if we could get to a certain weight, a certain aerodynamic drag, with the most efficient engine we could just go out and buy, we could get there. So the most efficient engine we could go out and buy is currently made by Honda. It's their R18A engine. It's one of the three engines you can get right now in the 2006 or newer all the way to now on the Civic. One of those three engines. Now in that car, the year it came out, it got 40 miles per gallon. Well, how do you get it up to 100? Well, our car weighs a little less than half what the Toyota Prius weighs, and has a little has right about half the total aerodynamic drag. So you do just those two things, and you're at 80 miles per gallon. You're a little bit further along than the Toyota Prius at 50. And then we do every little trick you might think of, and some maybe you won't, and you add those up together and you get another 20% fuel economy. So we do things like we preheat our fuel. That helps a little bit. It gives you about 2% fuel efficiency when you have stable fuel temperature that's already warm at engine start. We do every little optimization you might have heard of. And in aggregate, including a few that were pretty clever, we came up with a few innovations, and that's some of the very few things we haven't put in open source yet. That gave us the boost, and ultimately we scored 104 miles per gallon city and 114 miles per gallon highway in simulation of the EPA city and highway driving cycle when we were testing with the XPRIZE, which was pretty awesome. So that's how we did it. We bought the most efficient engine on the market, we reduced the weight, we reduced the aerodynamic drag, we understood which those might be through exploratory testing, which many people here already do, but we just applied it to the manufacturing setting, the R&D, and then we tried every little internet scam on increasing your fuel economy, we kept all the ones that worked, used all of them at once, and then while we were doing that, we learned a little bit and found a few other little clever things and put them together and got the most efficient gasoline internal combustion car in the world. Seems pretty straightforward. So then why doesn't every company in the world already do this? Oh, well, the cultural inertia, et cetera, et cetera. Ford still makes more money the heavier a car weighs. I think it's related to uh, contracts on bulk metal purchasing from foundries they made back in World War II and before. 
And so if you, they buy X amount of mild steel, they get it at an even lower price. And so they're incentive to do that. And they love the SVP boom we used to have. And they're not fans of the small carbon we're experiencing now. Um, in the 90s, Ford frequently said at the exact level, we can't make money on cars smaller than an F-150. <laughs> right, so um, when it's an unsustainable business model, it's an adverse uh, culture for innovation. And maybe that's part of why I don't honestly know why other companies don't do it. We put most of what we do up on Facebook. But when they're on 10-year development cycles, we still have another eight years before they'll have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hello, these guys uh, landed, what was it, less than two hours ago from Christchurch uh, and they're back on the 6.45 flight tomorrow, so...